am joined today by Professor Declan Murphy. Hello, Declan. Hello. Thank you for joining me. Pleasure. Now, Declan is the real deal, as you can see. He is a urological surgeon, and he is the director of GU Cancer at Peter McCallum Cancer Center. So he looks after men with cancer, but Declan, can you explain a little bit what does GU mean? GU is a genital urinary, and um, it's just we have to have a way of describing the bits of the body that we tend to uh, work in, uh, in various branches of medicine. So that's what we do. We're in the genital urinary tract. And for us, for me personally, that means uh, prostate cancer. It does also cover bladder cancer, kidney cancer, and so on. So it's quite a range of cancers in in GU cancer. Uh, But prostate cancer is by far the commonest, and I spend practically all my time looking after men with prostate cancer or men who are maybe concerned they might have prostate cancer. Yes, I understand you do a fair few robotic prostatectomies. I'm wondering Mm. how many have you done at this point? In total, in my career, I've done just over 2,000. Um, but you know, Victoria, I'm a, a full-time prostate cancer specialist, so I really only do one operation. Um, I do radical prostatectomy. I don't do um, stone surgery or kidney surgery and so on. So uh, those numbers will increase if you only do one operation all the time, and that's the operation I do. Absolutely. And I'm wondering, you do the nerve sparing procedure. Now, can you explain for people out there who may be hearing this the first time, what is a nerve sparing prostatectomy? So when we do a prostatectomy uh, for a patient, it's because that patient has prostate cancer. So one of the first goals of the surgery is to make sure that we um, adequately manage that prostate cancer by taking it out and so on. But unfortunately, the prostate lives in a very difficult part of the world. (laughs) Uh, It lives in an area that really wasn't meant to be interfered with. And there are two very important structures nearby um, that concern us as prostate cancer surgeons. And the first of those is the sphincter muscle, the urethra sphincter, the the valve that opens and closes to allow a man to pass Mm -hmm. his urine. And that's actually attached onto the prostate. So we have to be very careful in how we uh, remove that sphincter from the, the prostate. Uh, But the second area uh, uh, of interest for us around the prostate are these nerves, the famous nerves. Mm. Um, And these are the nerves that run from the spinal cord uh, uh, down alongside the prostate uh, and up to the penis. These are the nerves that are uh, responsible for erections of the penis. And in real life, unfortunately, they're very, very close to the prostate. I often say they're like skin uh, attached onto the prostate. And when we want to do nerve preservation surgery or nerve sparing surgery, we call it, we're trying to preserve those nerves. We have to be very close to the prostate and peel off that skin, if you like, uh, and leave those nerves behind. Okay. Now, when you say leave the nerves behind, are they just flapping in the breeze? Where are these nerves? Yeah, they're not flapping in the breeze. And, you know, in real life, we don't we don't see those nerves, actually. We never want to see them. These are these are very precious little very tiny structures Mm. um, and they don't just flap in the breeze they tend to sit within uh, a a kind of a bundle we often call this nerve as a a, these tissues as a nerve bundle Mm. and within the bundle there are fat and blood vessels and nerves and so on so they tend to run like a little uh, like a train track in fact when you look down into the the pelvis where I've just left the operating theater we we took a prostate out and we looked down and we could see a bundle of nerves running down one side of the prostate uh, and on the other side we could not see any bundle of nerves left because we removed those nerves with the prostate. The the patient had a big, nasty cancer, and we knew that we couldn't safely preserve the nerves without preserving the cancer. So so when we do nerve sparing, it's always a a planned thing. The extent of it uh, is always taking into account what sort of cancer has the patient got? Is it close to the nerves or away from it? And also, you know, how important are these nerves to the patient? Uh, Is the patient sexually active and so on and so forth? Absolutely. Now, if somebody is sexually active, so they definitely want to get nerve sparing, why is it that most men, even when they have nerve sparing, will straight after surgery usually have erectile dysfunction? Yeah, absolutely right. And patients sometimes say, oh, but you did preserve the nerves, and so what's happened? So I I like to say two things to patients um, uh, in terms of their expectations after surgery, if we are to perform nerve sparing to some extent or not. And the first is that it's almost a miracle uh, in my experience if a patient uh, gets reasonable erections any time within months after this type of surgery. Yeah. So I say to patients, honestly, it's, gonna, it's like a miracle if you get an erection. Do not expect erections. Mm. 
even in those patients, Victoria, who, as you see, you know, a year later or two years later, yeah. are getting reasonable return of those erections because it can be a long time. And those same patients that maybe have very good return of their erections um, two years after surgery will be in the same boat. They are not getting erections in the early months after surgery. So why is that? You know, those nerves that eventually get going are still there at the start. And the reason we believe is that these nerves are... Uh, not meant to be touched or you're not supposed to get near them so even if they are physically intact and they haven't been removed or divided and so on they do not like being anywhere near a prostatectomy so even though we can see things really well and we can be very careful in how we preserve those nerves they go into kind of shock afterwards mm -hmm. uh, and they just are paralyzed and they're not working uh, and, and that's uh, obviously very frustrating and so on for patients, but it also explains why we have to say to patients, you know, we need to have some realistic expectations. And the two expectations yeah. I gave are, first of all, as I say, it's like a miracle uh, if you get an erection in the early few months. And some patients will, but they, you know, they, then they're very pleased. They go, wow, you know, I wasn't expecting this. Yeah. Whereas if you're high, if your expectation is, well, I, you know, I'm having nerve sparing, I think my erections will be the same next Saturday night. No, they won't be. It's like a miracle if you get an erection. Um, but the second point I then make, having said that, is, okay, well, what sort of expectations will we have for this individual patient based on uh, his age, um, the quality of his uh, erections already, and the amount of nerve sparing we can do? What are the expectations down the line, yes. one year later, two years later, because it can take that long? And that's where we need to give re realistic, um, uh, very uh, tailored to that patient uh, predictions about what the return of erections might be like or might not be like, actually, for many men. Yes, absolutely. Patience is key, but it's the way you explained it explains why, that these nerves are so precious that yeah. I've heard it's even the heat and the light of the surgery experience these nerves do not like at all. So they go into that state of trauma, which can be months to years. Yes, and, 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 and so we're therefore very careful in what we know about. We've published a lot of papers about the anatomy of these nerves. We've studied them very intensely uh, in, in patients. Um, uh, so we have you know, precautions we can take about how we handle them, not using um, you know, cautery and so on and so forth near them. But even if you do all that and the nerves, and you sometimes look down into the pelvis and go, oh, they're beautiful nerves, and then they disappoint you by never get going again. So there's a lot we don't understand. Uh, uh, but I think we have to um, uh, make sure patients have realistic expectations about the short term mm -hmm. and the long term uh, likelihood of return of sexual function. Absolutely. And of course, what they can do to maximize the chances of nerve potential. Yes. And with nerve potential, is there any way that somebody, say, even two years down the line, could sort of tell what those nerves are doing? Do we have any ways of really looking in and seeing what they're up to? It's a good question because patients ask that. Well, you know, will they get going or can you do, can you do a test uh, to see? And uh, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. um, we have published a paper about using um, intraoperative nerve stimulation because, of course, we're always trying to find ways of improving nerve preservation. And there was a, there's a technology called um, ProPEP um, that's FDA approved in the US. And we did a prospective study um, here and published it in a big journal a couple of years ago where we used this nerve stimulation technology um, in theater, in the robot, to see could we identify these nerves. And what we concluded was, first of all, the nerve supply is very variable. Uh, it's not like there's a freeway down there and that's the way that Google Maps will take you to it and they're the nerves and they're not the nerves. It's, not, it's very variable. Uh, things tend to move around a little bit. And second, we showed that this very nice, it was a really nice technology, but it didn't help. It didn't improve uh, the quality of the, the nerve sparing. And look, we, we're still very optimistic. Other stuff comes and goes, all sorts of membranes and stuff that we can, we can use inside. But um, uh, I think we... We still have a way to go to, you know, um, improve technical aspects beyond where we currently are. Um, and I don't think gadgetry necessarily will do that. I, I think the single best way to maintain erectile function in a patient with prostate cancer is not to have any treatment at all. Um, and, and hence, we do a lot of active surveillance. We, we have a lot of men with prostate cancer in whom we, we don't need to treat them. And then, of course, they maintain their quality of life from sexual function. Um, but uh, the, the message there is that if you do anything to the prostate, whether it's surgery, even high quality surgery done by experts in, in big centers, radiotherapy, even high quality radiotherapy and so on, or even some of the novel treatments like focal therapies and so on, any of those things will impact sexual function to some degree. And, and we must be accepting of that. Yeah. So when patients come to see you and they are considering their treatment options, what questions do you wish patients were asking you every time or, or telling you about their lives? 
So when patients come, and the average age of the patients we operate on is about 61, and it ranges from younger to older and so on, but that's usually the age group of these patients. So uh, the number one concern for most people by far is the cancer itself. They've been diagnosed with cancer. They're you know, in middle age, maybe looking towards retirement. Maybe there's mm-hmm. grandchildren on the way. And the idea of cancer and, and all that goes with it is usually the number one thing. But, you know, the reality is, even in those cancers that look a bit aggressive, that we want to treat, not to put on surveillance, we we do really well from a cancer survival point of view, which is a great story. You know, that men, if they're diagnosed early, have a low chance of dying of their prostate cancer if they're managed well. And that tends to be the main focus. But what I, to answer your question, I think um, it's really, really important that we have that conversation with patients to say, yes, yes, we'll probably be able to manage this cancer. Okay, we'll, we'll do a nice job on this. But how do you feel about sexual function? How do you feel about yeah. at least temporary urinary incontinence? Uh, you know, uh, because everyone gets blindsided by the cancer. So a very typical story for me is, you know, um, six months or a year after surgery, uh, patient's done really well, the, the cancer's gone, it's undetectable, the continence has come back really quickly and they're doing great, no erections. Um, and, you know, the same patient will have sat here you know this very well as well, saying, no, 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 it's, it's, it's a, I just want to make sure I don't die of this prostate cancer. My, my, my mate died of it and I've got grandkids and I, you know, blah, blah, blah. But then you refocus because then it's still the same 61-year-old patient who's now cured of cancer, continent again, mm. no erections for six months. And, and it can come back, you know, the, the, the sense that I know I said that at the time that the most important thing was the cancer, but we really try and get patients to understand the impact of surgery yeah. and radiation treatment on short-term and long-term function. So, yeah, so I, I, I spent quite a lot of time talking to patients about that, the, the reality of that. And then, of course, because it's the most predictable uh, impact for us, you know, big complications are very rare with, with high quality surgery, but sexual function, at least short term, often long term, very common. So how we support those patients, I suppose, is, is where you and um, specialist nurses like Emma and uh, colleagues around the state yeah. come in. It's a really predictable thing. We need to roll it out. We need to prepare people beforehand and we need to have all those supports available to say, um, here's what we have to try and support this very predictable, at least short term part uh, of yes. your recovery. Absolutely. Making it clear, yes, this probably will happen, but there are things you can do exactly. that your quality of life may be yeah. impacted however it doesn't need to be something that you just have to live with you can do things exactly about this. yeah fantastic well thank you Declan no problem now Declan I understand you're very active on Twitter you're good on the social media where could people go if they want to continue to follow you and find out more about well, they your can work? follow you Victoria they can um, indeed you know <laughs> yes. I think I really love you're really good at this a touchy subject and of course you have some fantastic patients some of them are mine who are also very visible uh, in this space supporting patients telling their story absolutely uh, warts and all and uh, look I think it's really important we're very keen on using social media to um, help communicate to, uh, to patients and to, to learn ourselves I, I read a lot of um, the posts that come on your website and others um, so I like following you uh, but my Twitter handle is um, uh, at Declan G Murphy uh, uh, I love getting tweets from patients and so on fantastic well thank you again Declan this is great